Thanks, praise team. How many of you are singing uh, for all you're worth on those songs? Okay. Liar, liar, pants on fire. No. <laughs> but again, we, most churches uh, will, of course, sing before the, the message starts. And, um, and I know many of you really get into the music and, and sing, and that's how it should be. And I, I really find myself just falling into the music as well. It's a time of worship, and that's really what it's all for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your love and your care. You alone deserve our worship and our praise. Help us, Father, to listen to you in the next few minutes as we open up the word. Speak to everyone here and everyone watching and listening online that each of us might take something away from the music we've just heard, the message we're about to hear, the fellowship time before and after the service, that we might take something away which is going to draw us closer to you. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Say it with me. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Wow, I love that. I mean, this is the day. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. This is the day. Right now, right here. And uh, you can start your day every day like that if you want to. It's a choice. And, um, you know, I mean, you hear about the, the, old, the old joke. You know, you ask, ask the lady... Uh, did you wake up? Did you wake up this morning? Did you wake up grumpy? Said no. I let him sleep. You know, um, it's really a choice. Shalom, shalom. Part three. We're going to be talking this morning about the battle for your peace of mind. The battle for your peace of mind. How many of you have ever been in any kind of a a, a, a fight? You know, maybe like uh, you, you know. Brothers, sisters, anything like that. Okay, yeah, a few of you have. Some raised hands really big. Uh, means we'll have to talk after the service, okay? We'll have to, we'll have to chat. But I, I remember, too, like in Boy Scouts. Again, going back to those times. And my, my grandsons do this now, too. They play airsoft. You know, they have wars in their backyard with that. And they, you know, they wear things to protect themselves and stuff. But they're shooting at each other. And they're around trees and rocks and stuff. I don't know. It's something boys do. I guess girls do different things. But we boys used to do that kind of thing. And scouts, the same kind of a thing. And... It's, it was kind of fun. Some of you have been in the real wars, and that's not so much fun. But again, uh, we, we seem to be kind of wired like that, if you would. And I'll lead in, I'll tell you where that's going in just a couple of seconds. But we're going to start, first of all, with the verse we ended on last week. And it was a verse that Jesus gave us. And I maintain that it is a gift that Jesus has given us. It's from John 14, 27. It says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The New Living Translation, which is a good translation and a little more modern than some of the others. If you have a, a younger person perhaps in your family who's looking for a good translation of something a little more contemporary, you might consider that. It says it this way. Jesus says, I am leaving you a gift, peace of mind and heart. Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. And I just found my Hal Lindsey book with that title just this last week on my shelf. I said, there it is. I mean, I remember reading that back in the 70s. But Satan is at war with you, whether you realize it or not. And I'm not here to try to get you all upset about Satan, but he does exist. And it would be foolish for us to, to not realize that. And you are his enemy. And daily, he is after you. If you claim the name of Jesus, he is after you. You and I are in spiritual battles. Imagine, um, imagine you get home from church today and you have, you're not aware, but somewhere in your house is a bad guy who's broken in and means you harm. And if you walk into a bedroom and there he is in a closet or something like that, what are you going to do? I mean, you're going to probably holler out, you may swing, you may throw something at him, whatever you're going to do. I'm here to tell you that the enemy is in your closet, not Physically, but spiritually, the enemy is in your closet. And this is today, the title is, The Battle for Your Peace of Mind. If you're not experiencing peace, just generally, then the enemy is winning his battle with you. We're going to talk about that for this whole message this morning. Ephesians 6.12 says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, that's Satan and his demons, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The battlefield for all of this is in your mind. 
in your mind. Satan has declared war on you, your family, your marriage, your faith, your church, your Christian life. And he is a pro. He is a pro. Um, how many of you have ever played hide and seek with a two-year-old? <laughs> how effective is it when they hide? <laughs> well, where's Johnny? I just don't know where Johnny is. You know, and there he is, a big lump under the, under the cushion or something. Why are you able to find this little kid? Because you're a pro. I mean, you're, you're an adult, and he's or she's only two. Well, compared to the enemy of our faith, we're like only two. And he is a pro. Uh, you're not his first rodeo. He's been faking people out and lying to people for thousands of years. He was created by God before the world began. And he was cast out of heaven with a third of the angels because they sinned against God. And ever since then, he has been warring at anything with God, which puts us in his sights. He's had billions of battles with billions of people, and he started in the garden with Adam and Eve. And so I don't take him lightly. Uh, don't take him lightly. 1 Peter 5.8 says this. Peter, the strong Peter, you know, Peter the rock, Peter the guy who, you know, the go-to guy. Peter, the guy, when he wrote this, okay, he had already, day of Pentecost, he had already preached and won 3,000 to Christ that very first day in Acts. Peter says this in his writing a little bit later on. Be alert and, and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking, looking for someone to devour. So if you have a lack of peace, I know I'm starting out kind of negative. I'll give you some hope here before we end the message. If you're feeling a lack of peace, that means Satan is winning in your life. God, Jesus wants you to have peace. Jesus wants you to have peace. But with God's help, you can turn all of that around. So we're going to talk about two options this morning. One option is your mind is under Satan's control. The other option is your mind is under God's control. It's just simple as that. Two minds in the Bible talked about in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 verses 5 and 6 says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. The King James and the New King James says carnally minded. Setting your mind on the things of the flesh. So it's one or the other. Um, and so, the, the, again, the flesh battles against God because it... And here's what happens with a lot of people that you know. You and I know who don't want to come to church, who don't want to come to Christ, who don't want to hear about God. The flesh battles against God because they don't want to be crucified with Jesus. They don't want to accept the lordship of Jesus Christ. They don't want God to be God in their lives. They want to rule their own lives. And... More and more we're seeing that. I was just talking to a brother here just before the service started. He said he just read something in Decision Magazine that only about 30% of the churches in America today are really committed to the Word of God. That's amazing and very disappointing if that's really true. But your mind under Satan's control. Satan does mind control. He does uh, brainwashing, if you will. I assume none of you have ever been into, into a real brainwashing situation before, but Satan's doing it very subtly. And he does it by saying... Can you really trust God to do that? Do you really think he's going to come through? God didn't do that for you last time. What makes you think it's going to be different this time? You know, and all these kinds of things. Do such and such. It's a lot more fun than what God says you can do. And, and all, all these arguments. And you say, well, gosh, you're probably saying, you know, pastor, you're reading my mind. <laughs> no. It's just that we all have this in common. We've all heard all these arguments. We continue to hear all those arguments. Romans 7.23 says this. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind, the power that makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. C.S. Lewis said this, No man knows how bad he is until he has tried to be good. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? It's like you try to be good and you go, Oh, this is really tough. Oh, my gosh. So a couple of things I want you to consider. Now we're getting a little more practical. Number one, you are what you think. Proverbs 23.7 says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So is he. Um, your thoughts and my thoughts affect everything that we do. Our actions, our behaviors, our feelings, how we live. Um, again, if you tend to think negatively, you tend to act negatively. If you think sad things, you tend to be sad. If you think you're sick, you'll feel sick. Okay, got it. True. I got to confess. Maybe some of you have done this too. Did any of you? No, that phone's not for me. Um, <laughs> there were times, my sister's probably know this too. They probably went through it. I don't know. I had both my sisters here this morning. I could pick on them, but instead I'll pick on myself. 
I remember there were a few times, particularly in, well, I don't know what grade, elementary, junior high, I don't know, somewhere, and I didn't want to go to school that day. Probably I wasn't prepared with my homework, you know. And uh, I don't feel very good. I think I'm getting worse. Oh, I'm sure I am, yeah. Yeah, my stomach's starting to turn a little bit. And, you know, after about 10 minutes of that, you're just about ready to, yeah, just about, that's right. You know, you're just about ready to, to heave ho. Okay, did any of you ever do that? Talk yourself into being sick? You see, our minds are very powerful. God's given us a, a sound mind, and he wants us to use it properly. But we can also use it to make ourselves sick if we want to. If you think you're worthless, then you tend to, you know, act like you're worthless. If you tend to, again, harbor bad thoughts, you tend to do bad things. On the other hand, think godly thoughts, scriptural things, you tend to act more godly. When you let the devil control the way you think, then you're going to be filled with fear and anger, depression, pessimism, hopelessness, and maybe the Satan would love it for you to have a thought of suicide or two. Thoughts of suicide come from negative thoughts that are allowed to go to fruition. And that's what Satan wants. In John 10.10, Jesus is talking about good shepherd and bad shepherd. And I like to think about it as Jesus versus the enemy. And he says, the thief comes but to kill, to steal, and destroy. And so when I see that around the world or in our lives, kill, steal, and destroy, I'm going, I know the source of that. And it's not, it's not God. It's not almighty God. We tend to become what we think about. So... You attend church. Here you guys all are attending church. They're watching online. Hi, you online. You attend church. You're going to, at least for an hour, you're going to be thinking about God's stuff because you can't sit here and read a comic book without me seeing it. <laughs> Susan tried that before, and I got her on it. Okay. <laughs> so come to church, fellowship. And again, church is more than just listening to the pastor. Church is worshiping in the music. And I've said this a hundred times. I'll probably say it in, until... God takes us all home. I love what I see happening in our church family before the service and after the service. People come early and they go out there and they eat these non-calorie donuts, which is super. But they talk and they share and they laugh and they're, they're building this kind of fellowship. And uh, I love the size of this church. I think it's the right size church. If this were a church of 1,500, you probably wouldn't know as many people as you do in, in our church. I think this is just perfect. Um, so I just love what goes on here in our church services. The other thing, though, that you can do throughout the week, and I encourage you to, is, is get into a devotional. We have uh, our daily breads are packed there. They've been doing this for decades, They're putting those booklets out. Uh, I've got my devotionals, which come out Monday through Friday. Right now I'm doing a thing in 40 days in the Old Testament. I just finished the first week. You can always go back and catch up. Find out what's, what's the heart of each of these books in the Old Testament. What do they have to say? How does it apply to me? That kind of a thing. Just a quick overview in the next 40 days. So that's, that's the first one. We are, you are what you think. And so work on your thinking. What do you, what do you think about? Next, you are what you think. You, you think about what you're exposed to repeatedly. Okay, four times four equals what? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Let us have a moment of prayer. <laughs> Debbie was a math teacher. Maybe I need to bring her up. <laughs> but 2 plus 2 equals? There we go. 8 plus 8 equals? There you go. So how did you find out multiplication tables? How did you find out what some of these are? You repeated them over and over. Remember the alphabet? Remember the old alphabet sound? A, B, C, D, E. So we learned by repetition. Repetition, repetition, repetition. So we tend to repeat and become like and think about what we're exposed to re repeatedly. Now, on the other hand, let's assume that we spend all of our time in, in action video games, you know, that are destructive and shooting and whatever. And a lot of kids are doing that. I mean, or you're watching movies incessantly that have this kind of violence and stuff. I'm not saying you have to avoid all of that. But I'm saying at the same time, we tend to become like what we watch. We tend to become like what we repeatedly watch over and over again. Uh, your life, our lives are shaped by our thinking. And our thinking is by what we watch. Remember that old song a long time ago? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Okay, I was going to sing it, but I'm not going to do that this morning. But you, that'll put that in your thinking, okay? <laughs> that'll put that in your thinking. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little tongue, what you say. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Okay, those, those are, I mean, simple songs written 
who knows how long ago, but they speak truth. They speak truth, which is kind of nice. So the battle in our minds begins the day we're born. Have you ever noticed that little kids, even little tiny kids, even, you know, tend to be self-centered? I mean, babies, love babies, they're great, they're wonderful, but babies tend to be self-centered. Wah! I want to be held, I want to be changed, I want to eat, whatever it is. Some of you haven't grown out of that yet. You know? <laughs> but we tend, it starts then. We tend to be self-centered. And a lot of times when we see kids in middle school or high school or above who are also self-centered, it's because that's what they've been thinking about. They've been thinking about what's, that, what's in it for me, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this. We in Christ are like salmon swimming upstream. You know, you have to be, you have to be tough to be a salmon to go spawn and swim upstream. We're, we're swimming against the culture. And we've been doing that all our lives, but it's becoming more acutely obvious, I think, as the culture continues to um, fall apart. In fact, my series I'm going to start in March is going to be how to make a positive difference in a world that is falling apart. A new series. I don't have the material I'll put together for that, but God willing, I'll come up with some material which is worthy of your thinking, worthy of your prayer, worthy of your assimilation into your body and into your soul because it's based on the Word of God. Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3 out of the New American Standard, says this, And you were dead in your offenses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Okay, so here, Paul, who wrote this to the church at Ephesus, is calling Satan the prince of the power of the air. And I, I don't have time to get into all the Satanology kind of stuff, and I really don't want to spend time talking about him, but I have to, to let you know your, your great enemy. Your enemy is not the person next to you, your neighbor who you can't get along with, or something else. The enemy is the enemy of our faith here. So, in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all previously lived in our lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were natural children of wrath, just as the rest." There's a lot in that. I could unpack that for a long time. I'm going to have to just kind of skate through that quickly, except to say that, the, that here, Paul is letting the church at Ephesus know about their enemy, about their enemy, the prince of the power of the air. So if our mind, before we come to Christ, if our mind is basically have a, either your mind is Satan-oriented or it's God-oriented, so if our, before we come to Christ, it's the enemy is, is running the show for us. Uh, what does that look like? Well, the first one I have down here, first point in your, in your bulletin and also up here on the screen, is it's a, you have a depraved mind. Those people have a depraved mind. Romans 1.28 says this, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a depraved mind to those things that are not proper. I don't want to pick too much on culture this morning, but there's a lot of people with depraved minds who are, in fact, in places of authority. And it's really just uh, amazing to me, amazing to you too. Any of us who have been Christ followers for a while are just amazed what's happened in the last five years, last 10 years. It's just absolutely amazing, which means we have to be tougher, I think, and we have to, you know, again, pray harder. And that's another, another story we'll talk another time. But again, here we have depraved mind, which means they're basically filled with, you know, they're filled with evil thoughts and how to be self, how to, you know, in other words, God's not a part of the equation at all. The minds, they, the scripture calls it vanity, vanity. Ephesians 4.17 says this out of the Amplified. So this I say and solemnly affirm together with the Lord as in his presence, that you must no longer live as the unbelieving Gentiles live in the futility of their minds, futility of their minds, and in the foolishness and emptiness of their souls. The New Living Translation says, hopelessly confused. Futility of their minds, New Amer again, the New Living says, hopelessly confused. These people are hopelessly confused. Non-Christians, by the way, now I got to say this too, in their defense, non-Christians can and do say some uh, good things, but they do it in the flesh and God doesn't get honored by it. And we need to honor him with what we do. Titus, little book of Titus, 1.15 says this, Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving, because their minds, their, their minds and consciences are 
corrupt. So, before Christ, we had a depraved mind. We also have a blinded mind. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this, Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. In, um, in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, there was, a, there was a verse I threw in here. In those days, before there were judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I thought that, I thought about the verse. Is, again, isn't that what's happening today? Yeah. Everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. And this is different than what we all grew up with, okay? We grew up with a world that was generally um, sympathetic, at least attitudinally, towards the Bible. They would talk about the good book. They would talk about the man upstairs. And even from the founding of this country, you know, again, not everyone was Christians. We had some deists and stuff, but even deists like Ben Franklin said, you know, we, when they were having the Constitutional Convention, we need to pray to God, okay? And so that's been our MO since, you know, since the country was founded. And yet today we're having, just like the Day of Judges, everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. My truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. And we're getting, it's just amazing times, amazing times. But let me talk to you about someone who you know, okay? So, I, and I, I'm not going to mention a specific person like this person over here, but someone that you know who is not a Christian, who you care about, a family member, a neighbor, a longtime friend, somebody. And I have talked with many of you who just agonize over the fact that this person or this person, your, your, your friend or two or three that you've got, who, who you've had friends, we've been friends for decades, and they know that where I stand with Jesus and where Christ, I go to church, and they kind of, you know, okay, whatever. But they don't have any part. So you worry about them. You're concerned about them. Well, this verse tells us something important, I think. Again, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. So, your friend has a blinded mind. It's like, it's like you're, you could talk truth all day long and you could do the best apologetic study possible. You could say, well, here's why the Bible is true and here's why we believe Jesus really rose from the dead. And those are really important things. But their eyes are blinded by the enemy. And so I have a couple of suggestions for you if that's, if that's your situation. And I, 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says... If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. Wow. Okay. If we ask anything according to his will, and then we read 2 Peter 3, 9, which says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. God wants everyone to come to repentance. God wants everyone to be one of his children. And so I believe, and I encourage you to pray that 1 John 5, read that over again, and the 2 Peter 3, read that over again. You've got the notes, you've got the scriptures listed in your bulletin. I, I really would suggest that you pray regularly that God would remove the blinders so they would see the truth about Jesus Christ. And you may be the only person who can pray that way, but they are essentially bound by darkness they're bound by darkness unless someone like you comes in and helps rescue them from that. It's very possible that you're the person for that. So there you go. That's, that, I think that's important. Okay, so that's under the, the minds that are controlled by Satan, the non-Christians that are out there. Now, you're, the other option is for our minds to be under God's control. And God wants to fill us with his, himself. Um, again, one of our key verses here for this particular study, the Shalom Shalom study, uh, comes from Isaiah 26.3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Shalom, shalom. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. And, that's our, and so that's, that's what we're talking about, the mind of Christ. Philippians 2.5 says this. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So we have our minds and our opinions about what is right, what is wrong. And we could probably have great debates about that in here. We say, okay, let's talk and let's debate, you know, right and wrong and all this kind of thing. And I'm not talking politics. I'm just talking lifestyle and conscience and, and, and what's, what's going on. And we also have opinions, and I won't ask for a show of hands, but I know people have a lot of opinions about how other people should act. 
you know, well, my neighbors, you, if you had any idea, my, uh, the, how they should act, how they should talk, how they should think, how they should live. And uh, I, I call this a God complex. How many of you know somebody with a God complex? Okay, maybe you're sitting next to him. And so basically, and they, they do it in a gentle way, but they basically want to tell everyone how, how to live and how to, do, how to live life and how to dress and all this thing. I got to be honest and tell you, of course, I always try to be honest, but this church doesn't seem to have a lot of that. I've been in other churches where if you didn't wear the right shirt, if you didn't wear the right, you know, whatever, you would be, I mean, you'd be thrown out on your ear. And that's not the case here. There's just a lot of love and joy in this place. And when I talk to people who have visited maybe for the first time, oftentimes people will go to a church. I'm not being critical. I'm just reporting the facts. Um, people will go to a church somewhere and they'll walk in and they'll have the service. And they'll walk out and no one has said boo to them. In this church, I find people say, I went, visited your church. I must have been tackled by 12 people. <laughs> And I go, that's good. Yeah, we, we teach that. We have a football scrimmage regularly so we can tackle them just fine. So God is not interested, though, in our opinions. We can talk to him and we can share, but he has his opinion. And, um, I mean, opinions of other people, they're kind of a dime a dozen. Everyone has, everyone has one. But again, God wants us to have, here's the point, God wants us to have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Uh, mind of Christ. And this is, this is a pure, this is, this is godly, this is putting us in the right spot, mind of Christ. And that's what we do on Sunday mornings. We talk about the word, we talk about, you know, Jesus, and hopefully give you a little bit more uh, ammunition to live your life for, as, a, as a Christ follower during the week. Next, we talk about the mind of love, the mind of love. Matthew 22, verse 37 says this, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The mind of love. Got to keep moving. Um, we love God by using our minds and our hearts, our souls. Our soul is our, our will, our emotions, our personality, all of that. Uh, all our strength is strength. Uh, but we, that's how we love God. We love God. And so we have the mind of love. We have, next we have the mind, the renewed mind. Romans 12, 2. 12, 2 says this. And do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, when we come to church week after week, hopefully by exposing you to sharing the word in a way that, that is hopefully uh, interesting and um, makes sense, you know, and that's why I pray for every, every Sunday. I, you know, I have my notes and I have kind of an outline of what I'm doing up here and, and then God kind of fills in the blanks as I kind of go along. But I also am really hoping every week that you're able to become more and more like Christ. More and more like Christ. That's, that's our goal. And the renewed mind is part of that. Again, do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. A renewed mind. John 16, verses 8 and 9 out of the Amplified. And, when, and he, when he comes, will convict the world about the guilt of sin and the need for a savior and about righteousness and about judgment, about sin and about the true nature of it, because they do not believe in me and my message. So again, you know, Jesus wants us to live a righteous life. He wants us to live a life that's different from all the people around us. And there should be something different about us. Um, let me continue on. Ephesians 4.23 says this, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Spirit of your mind. Now, I know enough of you, one-on-one uh, -on -one and talking small little group stuff, to know that many of you are growing in your faith, which is super. But I don't know everybody online, and I, don't necess I can't necessarily... Um, how many of you ever used your dipstick to figure out how much oil you got in the car? Okay, most guys have put their hands up at least, some gals too. Okay, well... I wish we could do that in terms of how are you doing spiritually? I just stick in a, you know, a dipstick and pull it out and go, whoa, we need to talk, you know. Um, but I can't do that. I can't do that. So I, I just have to trust that you're growing in the Lord and that you're actually trying to apply some of these things to your life so that you can develop the mind of Christ and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Next, so we should have the mind of love, the mind of Christ, the renewed mind, then one mind. Romans, 12, Romans 15, 6 says this. So that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the, law, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote that to the church in Rome. 
And basically, they, had, they have difference of opinions, and people can have difference of opinions, you know? I mean, how people have different opinions about how, um, how the front of our church looks, and, and uh, all the, they can have opinions about lots of different things. But what Paul was looking for at the church at Rome, he was looking for them to be of one mind and one spirit, you know, striving together in one faith for the gospel. And I, I feel like we have a lot of that here. We have tremendous unity here at our church. People have different ideas, and they bring different spiritual gifts to bear. But there's tremendous unity. There's not a faction over here. There's not a faction over there. I have been in churches in the past where, you know, you had people who sat over here because they all thought the same way. And these people, it's like the Hatfields and the McCoys, okay? Um, and actually, if I had that this morning, I think this side's got more people in it. They'd probably win, you guys, okay? Don't have enough people over there. But you get what I'm saying. There are churches like that. There have been in the past. I don't sense that here. There's a lot of love and unity here at our church, which is really great. Philippians 1.27. So again, here's some other examples of one mind. Philippians 1.27. That you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving for the faith of the gospel. 1 Peter 3.8. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Philippians 2.2. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now, Paul, because he was at a distance, I think, um, had some, there, some of the churches got a little bit flaky, and so that's why he's speaking real strongly here. But one mind is, is what we should have, and we, we have that here. I feel like we really do here, which is nice. Um, how many of you ever played the electronic game? A long time ago, it was a computer game called Lemmings. Anybody play Lemmings? Debbie and me. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Lemmings was a fun little game. Is that when the PCs first came out uh, before Windows, it was a DOS game. And basically, you had little lemmings, and you had, to, you had to make these little men go over here, and you had to make them make a little hole, and they all dropped down. They went to the next level and stuff. But the thing is, the lemmings all looked the same. They looked the same. They sounded the same. They worked the same. And I look around here this morning, and I love the variety. I love the variety. It's just great. God didn't make us lemmings. Isn't that nice? Aren't you glad? Amen? I mean, really, it's, all, it's just really kind of nice. I think that's super I just love it. But we're not lemmings, and we have different ideas, different thoughts, and that's just that's different gifts. We'll talk about gifts at another time. But the goal, again, is the same for all of us, no matter where we are in the spectrum of our, of our walk with Christ, whether we're fairly young in the Spirit, whether we've been walking with the Christ for decades, you know, it doesn't really matter. But we have the same goal, and that is we want to bring honor and glory to God. Bring honor and glory to God. Our little saying that we have around here is, love God, love others. And our mission is simple. Encourage others to follow Jesus. Encourage others to follow Jesus. Let me wrap up. There are other minds in the scripture too, besides the ones I've just shared here. In scripture, uh, God wants us to have a willing mind. He wants us to have a ready mind. He wants us to have a lowly mind, a sober mind, a pure mind, a sound mind, a serving mind, a fervent mind. That's all those are all things that we need to have in, in Christ. But there's a battle going on for your mind. I come back to the very beginning of, the, of my talk this morning. There's a battle going on for your mind. The enemy wants your mind. He wants to control you and your thoughts. And he's going to put things in your way every day, multiple times a day, to make you upset, to make you discouraged, to make you pessimistic, to make you whatever, to try to trip you up. So you need to know that. I'm telling you what your enemy is like right now. Some of you know that. We all need to be reminded of that. And, and there are folks in here right now who I know are struggling. There's a lot of people who are struggling, probably online too, who are struggling with you know, depression or discouragement or upset or, you know, I mean, it goes down, it, it just becomes really huge. None of those things are from Christ. Christ does not want you to be discouraged, frustrated, depressed, but God and Christ and the Holy Spirit will help you out of whatever you're in. It may not happen overnight. It may take time. But with his help, you can survive and get through it and come out the other side and be stronger for it. And I know there are folks, perhaps online, who I don't even know your situation, but it's, it's dire. Maybe you have a situation where you've got family members you haven't talked to for 50 years. Just such hatred there, such discord there, whatever. God can turn that around. He can turn that around. I'm not a Pollyanna. I'm a realist. Jesus Christ is God. The Holy Spirit is with us, and he can do anything. Wow. Philippians 4.8. You've heard this before, but if there were one verse that I think you need to take away from today, it'd be this verse. 
And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Now, again, this series is about peace. So it really is a fo focus of where we're putting our, where we're putting our thinking. So to, you would say, you might come up and ask me, well, does that mean I can't, I can't think about my family member who's really in, in trouble and I'm really agonizing? No, you can think about them. You know, pray for them. Do you mean I can't think about what's going on in the government? No, you can think about that and pray about that. But again, don't let it push you over the edge to the point where you now, working with someone who's depressed, you now become depressed. Because I find that, again, you know, depressed people can't help depressed people out of being depressed, for example. You know, you've got, to, you've got to be in a different level. One more time, let me read that verse to you. It's so important. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Again, Paul is pouring out his heart to the Philippians here. And Philippians is one of the most positive books in the whole Bible. It's just a great book. But he says, now one final thing. Fix your thoughts. And again, all this morning is all about your mind. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are worthy and excellent Worthy of, that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice, here's an important one, keep putting into practice all that you have learned and received from me, which includes this verse, everything you have heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. This whole series is about peace and how you can have that peace that overflows. Again, we started out by talking about the verse that Jesus gave us from John. He said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, it's a gift. My peace I give to you, I do not give you as the world gives. The world's an Indian giver. The world gives you stuff and takes it away. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And again, the new living, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, heavy discussion this morning whenever we talk about the enemy of our faith. And I thank you that you protect us with your Holy Spirit so we can have that conversation and not get dragged down into depression because of him. Lord, I really pray for the folks here in our church and watching us online. I pray for the heaviness that they may be feeling about somebody they know, somebody they love, or even their own walk with you, which may not be where it needs to be. It is so easy, Lord, so easy for us to look at world events or events here in our own country or in our own community and get discouraged and depressed. And you don't want us to do that. We need to be aware, but you're God. And we need to be able to rise above that and show people how Jesus can make a difference in their lives. With your head still bowed and eyes closed, if, if the Lord spoke to you somehow this morning and kind of gave you a, a word that you need to take with you and put into practice, I'm not going to ask you what that is. But if that's your situation, would you just put your hands up? Just put a hand up, let me see. My goodness, hands everywhere, hands everywhere. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your hands. You can put them down. I'm hoping that every one of you will take something from this, some of the message, something from the music, something that will draw you closer to Jesus and help you to deal with what's ever on your plate. Father, I pray for these hands that have gone up and others who are thinking about it and maybe just didn't get their hand up quickly enough for me to see it. Lord, I really pray that you'll help them to remember what it is that your Holy Spirit spoke to them during this service that they can take it with them to make a difference in their lives and perhaps the lives of, of a loved one or a friend that really needs you. It needs to be brought up, needs to be lifted out of whatever they're in. Thank you, Father, for your presence this morning with us, as you always are. Thank you for the word of God, which is a lamp unto our feet and light into our path. In the name of Jesus, amen.